Greetings, film freaks. We are the Podcorn Kernels. Join us as we discuss the hard and often indigestible truths that are at the center of the fluffy and delicious world of cinema. Season 2. What's poppin' people? Welcome to the Podcorn Kernels podcast. My name is Adam and joining me in your ear holes is Harry. Say hello, Harry. I used to think it was saving his life from this warm sausage tea. On today's episode, we will be talking about Killers of the Flower Moon. This is a 2023 film directed by Martin Scorsese and stars Leonardo DiCaprio, Robert De Niro and Lily Gladstone. IMDb describes the synopsis as follows. When oil is discovered in 1920s Oklahoma under Osage Nation land, the Osage people are murdered one by one until the FBI steps in to unravel the mystery. Here is an original song to support the synopsis. We bleed for their greed. Bad deeds then we die. Their pockets we feed. We suffer, my tribe. Planting their seeds. In us then they try. To take what is ours. Move in, then goodbye. Then goodbye, then goodbye. Kill my tribe, kill my tribe. Then goodbye, then goodbye. Kill my tribe, kill my tribe. Oil rich. But treated poor If roles were reversed We'd be no more A plague on our land A curse on our people We're in high demand Their kindness is lethal Kill my tribe, kill my Then goodbye, then goodbye Let's start with some facts about the film. Martin Scorsese said that when he read David Grand's book, Killers of the Flower Moon, he knew that he had to make it into a movie. Scorsese spent several hours together with Chief Standing Bear to convince the Osage Nation to help with the filming. That's cool. Shout out to Chief Standing Bear. Mm -hmm. What a name. I think Lily Gladstone said as well that it changed the film involving the Osage people. So they, the film was one vision. Mm. And then by involving the Osage people, he, he actually changed the film for the better, they said. I would still would have liked to have seen the original without the input of the Osage people and see how he interpreted the text without getting any help from the native. Yeah, I think a film like this requires to have at least some input from those that were, well... They're not going to be directly affected, but had the ancestry, the, the heritage comes from those yeah. people that were affected. I think it's important to get a sense of a culture, lifestyle, what's important to, to those specific group of people. Yeah. And I just like that he's, he, him, Chief Standing Bear and Chieftain Director Man united to tell this story. I quite like that. It adds to the grittiness, the realism. Mm. Robert De Niro was irked by Leonardo DiCaprio's frequent ad-libbing. According to Martin Scorsese, every now and then, Bob and I would look at each other and roll our eyes a little bit, and we'd tell him, you don't need that dialogue. Why was he doing that? I'd, I love that you've got a younger pup like DeCap going, <laughs> like playing, going, oh, I want to do it like this, why do this? And you've got two old dogs that are like, no, just calm down. Leo, calm down. We're doing it like this. We don't need your improv. This is how we're doing it. Wow. Did any of them stay in the film, do you know? I'm not sure. I know like Scorsese's quite, he's renowned for being quite to the letter. He, he's not really, he, I, from what I've heard about him, I don't know the bloke. From what I've heard, he likes it to be quite, no, these are your lines. Yeah. Okay. And some directors are the complete polar opposite. Like they like run with it, go with how you think, but he's very by the book. I think Ridley Scott's a bit like that. He likes people to, I mean, if they do experiment with their own own words, yeah. go for it if it works. But, hmm. but DiCaprio is like the... Scorsese's De Niro of recent times, isn't he? They've collaborated loads together. So you'd think by now DiCaprio would be like, you know, Daddy Scorsese doesn't like it when I dance on my own. 
I think it showed, you know, especially if it, if he did it in that scene in the car when De Niro and DiCaprio have just found out that the guy they've hired to kill the melancholy native Indian in this Henry and they're in the car. De Niro's shouting about, why didn't, why did he shoot him in the back of the head? Should have shot him in front of the head. It was supposed to be a suicide. And then DiCaprio turns and goes, he just shoot him in the back of the head. Yeah. And I was like, what the hell was that? <laughs> it's really out of place. That line delivery and everything to me was like, that was a bit weird. I wonder if that was one of the things that irked them. I wouldn't be surprised because he he's got this sort of Ricky Gervais from Derek character. <laughs> he's got he's he's got like a what do you call it an underbite where his bottom half of his jaw is more extended than the top, and, and he does he pulls yeah. he has that sort of facial feature throughout. But in that scene you're talking, it's like he's goofing off for like an old school blooper that's going to be included in the extras. Seemed it, but I didn't even clock that until you said look at this bit and send it to me. And I was like, <laughs> fucking hell. It's like he's playing a completely different character. It was very strange. And he has his two front teeth. I think he's got false teeth in the film. This character that he plays in this film is a little different to his normal characters. He's a, he's a little simple. He's character Ernest Burkhart. He's not the sharpest tool in the box, is he? No. And he's he's not necessarily really charming or charismatic. He's quite, he's quite a simple Simon, it's fair to say. He's the most unusual protagonist of a film, I think, that I've yeah. seen. Yeah. It's it's an odd one, but I, I don't know about you. I did like seeing him in that slightly different role. And I love the thought of him being in a scene, maybe not in a scene with De Niro and the old guard Scorsese and De Niro going, fucking hell, Leo's at it again. Like, no, no, no. What are you doing? Why are you ad-libbing? You know the rules. Stick to the textbook. Mm. Just love that. Very weird character. Yeah. Strange. The investigation into Osage County was the first investigation presented to the newly formed Federal Bureau of Investigation. It was led by J. Edgar Hoover. Now... Caprio played him in a movie. Yes. Yes, he did. Now, that's an interesting fact, but isn't it such an American thing to do in a story where there is a indigenous group of people that are being mistreated, mishandled, exploited all of these terrible things isn't it such an american thing to do to be like this is the fa fbi's first case look at how good we were we came in and stopped this historically true yeah but that group of people is also the root of the problem and the film focuses like fbi is coming to save the day no 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 you need to be more you need to be doing more to villainize those fuckers that screwed these people over. yeah it seemed it seemed like in them times that they were obviously Native Indians considered second class citizens. So the fact that it took how many deaths, like twenty, before they even at least before Plemons even put his jaw in, jawline into the shot. Yeah, I think with Hoover, he was always trying to promote the FBI. He always wanted it to be taken seriously because it was a new thing, it was a new idea. So he needed big cases. He needed to get the abbreviation FBI mm. into into the world. You got to strike fear into people. I mean, it's quite a hefty case for the first one. Mm. So kudos to them for actually getting it sorted, I guess. Didn't it start with Dillin- John Dillinger, Public Enemy? I think the FBI started by hunting down J- Dillinger, the bank robber, with the Tommy guns and the cars. What did Dillinger do? Bank rob? I might have the name completely wrong, but yeah, Johnny Depp played him in a movie. Public a, Enemies? Public Enemy, yeah. I think yeah. he was a bank robber in Chicago. Okay. I think the FBI yeah. hunted, uh, hunted that down. That was pre-World War II, I think. mm but yeah, that was yeah. This was a big case for them. Yeah, yeah. What did you like about Killers of the Flower Moon? No expenses spared. No expenses spared. Okay. Uh, it looks wonderful. Yeah, it does. Uh, and filmed on actual location as well, which is a plus, I reckon. Mm. Absolute plus. I uh, loved one of the early scenes of the native Indians dancing around like a an oil geyser. So yeah. it's the natural oil spilling from the ground, and it's slow motion. You can hear the the drums, the rhythm, and they're doing this wicked native dance in slow motion around this blowing up of oil geyser. And I wanted the imagery of that to keep happening in the film. Striking, isn't it? Yeah, and it looked incredible. Everything looks really crisp in this film. Very 4K digital looking, really Mm. really sharp. And I, I just think he doesn't hold back. I mean, look at the street in it. It's like an old cowboy thoroughfare, isn't it? Yeah. And it just looks... 100% 100% real. The cars, the the clothing, everything. He doesn't he doesn't skimp ever. Never. Yeah, I think you, you know Scorsese's one of the greatest to ever do it in in my personal opinion anyway, and he's got such a rep- reputation now and such a repertoire that the man can be like I'm making this film. 
and whatever studio he's making the film for, they're like, all right. And he's like, I need this much money. They're like, okay, you're fucking Martin Scorsese. Of course you can. Well, it's, that's the only reason he can get away with three hour, 30 minute films. Exactly. I yeah. I mean, and if nothing else, I don't know what your opinion is of this film. We haven't really spoken about it before pressing records, but like you say, but even if you absolutely hated the film for, for how it, how it, the story it's telling you how the how it's told any of those things you can't deny that in a as a filmmaking feat it's impressive and the way it looks is definitely one of the the biggest selling points isn't it absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. it's definitely um it's atmosphere over narrative but that doesn't mean it's bad necessarily yeah it's just it's different mm. i think films that are so long as well they are tricky to to do a podcast episode on because there's so much ground covered and like you say, when the film opens, and that's one of the first scenes, isn't it? It gives the audience a sense of they've basically struck gold. They've struck oil. Mm-hmm. And the fact that it's coming up like a uh, like a geyser, like a fountain, like huge, and they're dancing, and it's because they know that the value and stuff like that, it sort of sets the precedent for the, the rest of the film. And there's not one scene, there's not one beat that looks out of place. It's all an absolute feast for the eyes. And yeah. the ears as well. I think the, the, the music and the sound work on it is all quality as well. Yeah. What other things do you like about it? Lily Gladstone, I think she's the movie's most compelling character for me. Mm. Uh, I think the film could be guilty of potentially telling the film from the wrong perspective. Yeah. Or not using the uh, Osard characters in a way where we see like the real effect of what it did to them. I just felt like we should have seen it more from her perspective. Yeah. I think it would have been good if, in fact, a lot of the scenes actually started with her. And it was people like DiCaprio's character who is, without being derogatory, a simpleton you yeah. know, of the time. And De Niro's just this really devious, scheming piece of shit. I would have liked it if they were coming into the scenes because she started the scene. Yeah. Like, I would have liked, preferred to have seen it from her perspective. I don't think she had enough screen time to warrant, like, a, a potentially winning an Oscar for it. Yeah, I, I, I tend to agree with you. I'm, I'm glad you highlighted her as a, as a positive because I do think she was, she was fantastic in Brilliant. this. But I, like you, I don't think she was given enough to do. Like that's something I mirror that sentiment exactly. Like this is the Osage people story. It should only be seen from the Osage perspective. The FBI comes in later on. That's fine, but it shouldn't. The story shouldn't be told by a a husband who's not as sharp and isn't necessarily realizing how he's been manipulated by his little finger of an uncle. He knew. He fucking. Knew. I think he learns to know. At the first, I think he was slow on the uptake. I think he. he, he, he it took him a while, and and the longer it took him, the more he was falling in love. So he's an. In, I found him an interesting character. But you're right. This this it should be only from. Um, Lily Gladstone's eyes and her family's eyes. They're the ones that are getting fucked over and they're kind of secondary characters, which is really odd when the focus is showing the in, the injustice dealt by these people, by DiCaprio, mm. by um, De Niro and how it impacted the Osage people. Yeah, her surviving it is is the focus for me. So I want her to survive it. So therefore it should have been told more from her perspective. It's very strange to watch a film where you're following the bad guys scheming for greed and pretty much winning for ninety eight percent of the film. It's so yeah. like it's 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 a strange experience. I think that I think as a duo of bad dudes, De Niro and DiCaprio, if they were secondary to Lily Gladstone in this, their characters could have been far more interesting. It's, it, it's an interesting decision made by Scorsese, and in the fact section, we said that uh, he had um, direct help by chief standing bear to make to make this film and to tell their story maybe it was a decision a joint decision by chief standing bear and scorsese to tell it from the villain's perspective because it was the osage people that were victims so they wanted to shine more of a light on look at how awful these people were Mm -hmm. like look at how bad they were and don't don't focus on our narrative we know that we are the ones that struggle look how bad they were look at the facts of what they did how awful these people are maybe that was a reason behind the decision i don't know yeah makes sense yeah yeah it was like maybe he wanted to just sober his audience to that time in history yeah and how rotten it was but i do think that makes the narrative struggle i won't go in it too much but that is one of the things i disliked about it is that that narrative decision mm. but before we get there have you got any more likes for me i've got an oxymoron like i love me an oxymoron so it's a like and it will become a dislike but i'll explain it anyway hit me with your rhythm stick the tension was excellent in the mm. opening third of the film i found is accompanied by 
Robbie Robertson composed. Mm. He's worked with Scorsese before, and he died after this film. Mm. Uh, Did he? Yeah, the film, it had an honouring to him in it. But yeah, he composed lots of films with him, Silence, and etc. Uh, I love his pace setting score. The way the film yeah. starts, it's like all, all. Oh, There's going to be big reveals in this. Yeah. There's going to be this and this. But it just keeps going until everyone we sort of care about is dead or dying or is or is in prison. Yeah. And there's still even an hour to go after all of the biggest events in the film. Yeah. And that tension does keeps going. But the problem is when you watch this film, you're watching it from the perspective of the bad guys, you're aware of every scheme. Nothing happens by surprise. Yeah, yeah. You know they're going to bomb a house. The house doesn't blow up and then DiCaprio's like, Who's the, what, what's going on? He knew. Yeah, he's in on it. So it's weird. The tension setting music I adored in the opening third because I was excited. I thought I'm sitting down for a big Scorsese three and a half hour. Yeah. And I really enjoyed The Irishman. Yeah. So I, I thought I'd be, you know, you know I was overly excited for this film. Like so much to the point, look, we almost had a fight because you saw it without me. And I was, I, I was ready to pull knife and shank you. We didn't almost have a fight. Like we, the only reason it didn't come to physical blows is because we were ten Guinness deep. Yeah, but it was it, it, it just to paint a picture for the listeners. I sort of revealed to Harold that I'd seen this film in the cinema, and it felt like I was saying to a partner, L- "Listen, I got drunk and I cheated on you." Well, we'll let them decide, but I've always had a, an issue with the fact that you say I watch films of my partner in the cinema. That's our thing. I'm like, we have a fucking film podcast together. Do you know how ridiculous that is? Yeah. And me and the partner have spoken about this. An yeah. agreement, a treaty has been met. Yeah. We will, in the future, yeah. you and I will visit cinema for said podcast. Just in time for all the shit films. Yep. Yeah. And she has to understand that the podcast means more to me than she does. That is so cold. That is so not true as well. Yeah. You done with your likes? Yeah. 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 Shall I go on to mine? Yeah. I'll tell you what I liked about it, mate. Go on. I'll tell you. Big old double Ds. Big dicks? No, no, not quite. Nothing tickles my pickle more than watching two big, juicy and full-bodied, brilliant actors share the screen together. I'm, of course, talking about DiCaprio and De Niro, the king and prince of cinema. I, for one, love seeing them share this cinematic space and I enjoyed seeing DiCaprio play dim-witted and De Niro playing dangerous. I don't know about you, but it makes me happy to see Bobby get a substantial role and DiCaprio is great value in it in absolutely everything he does. Now, De Niro's popped on my screen for Warburton's recently. A bread. fucking bread that I can't digest. And Uber Eats. And to is see he- him get to see him get a juicy role where he's got actually stuff to do it just warms my cockles is he just happy short of money or something he can't be he's like one of the biggest stars ever unless it's it's about cementing security for his family and that because he's he's getting into his his twilight years so he's doing an advert for warburton's bread uber eats so he technically you could go on uber eats order warburton's grocery delivery of bread to your house Mm mm-hmm and De Niro's had a digit in both of those dogs. And if he delivers it... If he delivered it... That would be insane. I would order it every day. Why is he doing loads of adverts? I don't know, but that's what I mean. That's why it's a like for me, because obviously DiCaprio's still highest billing. He's still peak of his powers. He's still A-list. Like, everybody wants a slice of DiCap. Well, if Daniel Day-Lewis was to do an advert, what would it be about? Cheese. No. Strong British cheese. <laughs> He's he's very pro Irish. I don't think he's he would be championing in British cheese. Kerry Gold Butter. Kerry Gold Butter. Yeah. From the man who starred in the boxer in the name of the father. Yeah. My left foot. For a butter as smooth as he's line delivery. Oh. oh, that was much better. Yeah, we'll go with line delivery. Okay. But that's a like for me, because I've seen De Niro in some really bad films recently like straight to dvd at best films where he pops up he's doing like a what a morgan freeman's doing now and andy garcia or a sly stallone but actors that not to be rude are are past their sell-by date he's done a lot of that so seeing him in the irishman seeing him in this where he's got a lot of heavy lifting to do i like to see it and whilst both characters played by dicaprio and de niro were large unlikable i did think they were both great in this one. I don't know if you tend to agree. I don't know, again, if it's that thing where I can't separate the character from the actor. Yeah, but you know Bobby D and 
Leo D by now, right? I think Bobby D played a perfectly good bad guy in this. I wasn't over enthralled, overly enthralled with DiCaprio's character or performance. There was nothing I could pinpoint about it that I thought was great. I did, his accent's been sort of uh, used before in similar roles. I don't know. I just found him. It's a weird one. So Maybe I didn't like him as a person, the character it was, but I just don't think there was nothing meaty in it about him. Because he, he didn't really have a conscience. Yeah. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of it. You're, you're right, because you'd have to be extremely extremely dim more than we're led to believe this char- character is to have no idea what's going on around him mm. he has got an idea at least an idea of all the the dodgy dealings dealt out by de niro but it would take i don't know i found his character captivating because he was in a, a sort of inner turmoil because i do think he really loved his wife but i also think he really loved the money and i really think he didn't want to let his uncle down so he was quite a complex character in that sense he had a lot going on he had a lot of inner turmoil and stuff i thought he was good in it it's not it don't get me wrong if he was oscar nominated i don't think he is for best actor if he was Oscar nominated, I don't think he deserves an Oscar for this. He's performed much better in much better films, but I still mm. thought he was bloody good, personally. Yeah, I don't know. I was, yeah, I couldn't, I, I couldn't isolate his performance. No. Not for me, no. Run of the mill, DiCaprio. We've seen him be good so many times, you want to see him a bit better. Potentially, yes. That's fair. Yeah. Second thing I liked about the film was Scorsese's storytelling. I could honestly watch this man direct a story about why my mum chose floral wallpaper to decorate her living room and be wholeheartedly engaged. (laughs) Whilst I think this film was guilty of both being too bloated and leading with the wrong perspective narratively, I was fully engrossed in a film that seemed like a passion project from one hell of a great director. Yeah. So, he honestly, the man could make a film about anything and if I see his name linked with the film, I'm a watch it. What would that be called? And I'm a joy enjoy it the film about your mum's floral wallpaper um deliverer of the flower paper decisions in style mm. decisions on style yeah yeah i'd still watch it yeah i would i could watch him i could honestly watch his story about anything and probably enjoy some aspect of it he just knows what he's doing he doesn't do anything he doesn't love does he so and that shows through through the films he produces. Yeah. There's love. Even if you don't enjoy the film, you can see there's absolute love in it. I had a question about Scorsese. Can you think of him ever doing a sequel? Hmm. I don't think he... I can't think of a time where he's handled a project that's been more than one film. I don't think he has. Some bastard out there probably says, oh, it's a companion piece, which basically means it's unrelated. Yeah. Probably not. I don't think so. Mm. Imagine that. Imagine if he did a sequel to, to Goodfellas. Or Silence 2. Yeah. Even quieter. Even quieter. Yeah. Yeah. Final thing I liked about it was it's just educational and entertaining. You know me, I love to be taught things through the medium of film. I had no idea about the injustice and despicable dealings faced by the Osage people, and Killers of the Flower Moon gave me insight into a shocking yet not so surprising true story of American greed. Pair this with a great cast, immense cinematography from Rodrigo Prieto and an atmospheric soundtrack from Robbie Robertson and you have a well-made, well-handled and well-crafted film that was manages to be both enlightening and engaging. Now, I will caveat that with it is a very long film. It is a film that makes that demands that you sit there and you basically have to give up a whole day for it because it's fucking long. But when at any time I see, like, I'm a huge Scorsese fan, I'm a huge fan of De Niro, huge fan of DiCaprio, and I think that that boosts the score up for this for me before even seeing it. Like, yeah. there's there's so many things going for it that it's going to have to do something pretty awful for me not to enjoy it. Yeah, it's a staple of your diet, isn't it? It's exactly that. Yeah. You you can have, say you love porridge, you love it. You I have adore it every day. It. You can have porridge that's quite mediocre some days. You get a little bit of honey in there, a little bit of butter, a few mm. nuts in there, a bit more butter, mm. some little pieces of dark chocolate. Porridge, if you like it... You're going to like it. You can play around with it. You're going to like it going in regardless. Well, it's like it's like pizza, isn't it? Mm. Even a shit pizza is better than no pizza. Yeah, that is, I mean, that is a and that is a famous saying as well. That is the, yeah. Even bad pizza is still pizza. Socrates first said it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What didn't you like about Killers of the Flower Moon? Actually, I want to go back to what you said about American Greed. Okay. We started all that shit, pretty much. Got to remember that. We put a foothold in North America with so the 13 colonies. We're the we started ar- it. We're the assholes. We started it, they finished it. 
So you've got to always include yourself whenever it comes to being, you know, Ad- derogatory towards the Yanks. Adam, Adam's an asshole. No, no, I'm just saying like, the governments or the people that are after the greed. That's not unique to Americans. Yeah, yeah. No, it's good. Good point. Well made. It's important that we're not just yank bashing. Yeah, we first we we're, first got there and tried to subjugate. And I think if locals. you listen to the podcast enough, you know we also have great problems with the British. Oh, huge. We're assholes. Huge. Yeah. Ready for dislikes, Dad? I am. Go. Robbie Robertson's pace setting score. Oh, here's that oxymoron. Here's that oxymoron. Yeah. So, again, keeps going when we all know, we know all the dastardly plans and everyone is, like, dead or caught. I, I would personally, after, after the schemes have all been done, I would have gone with a sorrowful fiddle for the last hour. A sorrowful fiddle. Right, yes, a sorrowful fiddle. That's, mm. That would have been my, my ting. It's a small dislike, but it just... When you're really aware now that that pace-setting score is still going yeah you're like what the f- it doesn't change does it fudge is that it does it does peak and but you're right when that suspense is filled and there's no longer suspense we're now just dealing in consequences it's still got that same beat that same like unnerving like almost like a uh, jaws-esque that that yes. very simple beat Heartbeat. from a bass yeah it doesn't change could be uh, intentional the, yeah could be a message saying like um this still does, demands reparations this is still a horrific a crime and end by maybe not uh, not talking about it or people not knowing about it. Maybe you should still feel tension over it. Yeah, do we? But that is a deep dive. Yeah, do we know if he did a dead before the film finished? Because if he this did was it... the last film he scored. Oh, so he had finished. He finished the score. He finished the scoring and then died. Oh, okay, because so I, I think thought... it was while he was watching it. Mate, well, it's take that. It's that fucking long. Three and a half. It might have. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I thought maybe that the reason it doesn't change is because he did a dead halfway through and couldn't finish it. So but, but, that's hilarious. But no, yeah. just keep it running. Yeah, keep it going. Yeah, he's not no longer with us. But no, that's that's sad news. I liked I like what he did in this film. Second dislike. Um, it's for me. It's a grind watching asshole scheme for three and a half hours. Yeah, it is. But now that some of that time's like sort of passed. I mean, I used, and I did the maths, 0.00532% of my life if I lived to 75 watching this film. Fuck me. I may have potentially, I might be guilty of this, I may have potentially watched it incorrectly. And if I may quote filmmaker Alfonso Cuaron, Mm. he put, Scorsese has chosen a distant and reflective stance favouring atmosphere over narrative denying us the easy satisfaction of moral superiority to the men on screen who managed to justify their hideous betrayals of their loved ones and still pretend to have a soul, and confronting audiences with the sin by a mission that must rightfully haunt the American soul. So I read that after I watched it, and I thought I might be guilty of watching it incorrectly. Is there, is there such a thing? I understand what you're saying, and that's an astute observation from Mr. Quran. Mm. I, I I can't maybe maybe I might be guilty of being right there with you because I can't I can't sort of withdraw myself from thinking that the narrative perspective was wrong. But maybe if I'm watching it already thinking that I'm only damaging my own experience of it. If that makes sense. Well, yeah, it's 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 a very new way for me to see a film like the way they've delivered the film. Like it's, it's so true what Alfonso Cran said, like it's atmosphere over narrative. Yeah. And I felt that throughout and that's why it did, it did feel like a grind. It did feel long. Oh, do you want to know how long you've spent of your life watching it? I, I was thinking that because I've seen this three times. I did the maths. Oh, so this is based on you seeing it twice. Okay. So according to the calculator, so seven hours is approximately 0.001% of your life if you live to 75. It's cool, isn't it? I really enjoyed doing that. Yeah. Yeah, I did. It's not at all sinister. Yeah, I did. I mean, when you think about it, if that's the case, I've probably wasted a larger percentage of my life just scrolling on my phone, looking at nonsense. Oh, absolutely. I'm not saying I wasted my life. I'm just saying I spent no, no, but, that percent of my life watching this film. But the idea of putting a percentage on how I've wasted my life is making me look really inward and being like, I've wasted a lot of it. We can stop right things. now. Do you have a cuddle? We could stop right now and just call it. Go play some basketball or something. Sounds good. Shoot some hoops. Yeah. Eat so some ham. If that weren't clear, my second dislike it literally was I th- I think potentially I might have miswatched the film. But I also don't have the beans or the fuel in the tank 
to go back to it yet. I'd have to wait a long time. It's not a tight 90 that you can chuck on just before bed and, and give it a fresh pair of eyes. Sounded like tight 90. Yeah. 90. Mm. Oh, shit. Naughty boy. But yeah, no, I, I mean, that kind of ties into what I think. I th- and now you saying that maybe you watched it wrongly. I never even considered that as a thing, but it was so well put by Alfonso. Yeah, mm. that's right. I'm on first name terms with the man. Yep. That maybe you maybe that maybe I'm guilty of that as well. I can say I'm not going to revisit it because I've watched it three times in the space of a year and I don't have the energy or emotional strength to do that again. Cinema Uno. Yeah. Mi casa dos. Yeah. Dos. Okay. Yeah, that's a lot, man. That I mean, a lot. That, that's one of my dislikes. Probably the biggest, my biggest dislike. You know, I, I sound a bit like DiCaprio in this film with a bit of a simple Simon, but it was just too long. I've learned to love slow burning, long runtime films. Scorsese's last film, The Irishman, was three and a half hours long, and I mopped that dog up with red wine and bread and absorbed every minute with great pleasure. Oh. But Killers of the Flower Moon unfortunately felt like it outstayed its welcome. The first and third act I actually thought were brilliant. It showcases textbook Scorsese build up of tension and drama, but that sag in the middle. Uh, it just felt so hefty and I would have liked some of that fat trimmed off. I understand this was a story that spanned a long period of time, but I couldn't help feel restless around the two, two and a half hour mark. And I feel mm. bad saying that. And the, you, your point has made me think maybe maybe I'm the problem here. Maybe the film wasn't too long because I had a great time with The Irishman. I danced with that dog all night long. I liked that. I adore long films. I mean, yeah. if you sit me down with Bridger on a River Choir, or Lawrence of Arabia, they, there's an e- there's an epic old charm to them that mm. keep you there. But also, they're films where it was all about the reveal and the big action sequence. So yeah, it kept you kept me in a lot more. Whereas this film, again, it's like you're just you're watching a painting evolve. Yeah. I don't know. It was a weird feel, but I love I adore long films. Yeah, I would never criticize a film for its length, but this film, just what you said, the sag in the middle. It's it's my belly when I turned thirty. The shit just dropped. Hey now, and hey you're an all star. Yeah, get your game on. But be kind to yourself, please. All right, mate. Because you're you're no Brendan Fraser from Wales, mate. You're like seventeen less than that. So don't be so harsh. That's yourself, not a right? fucking compliment. Yeah, it is seventeen times less Cunt than a man. Weighed about sixty five stone. Well, You're saying I weigh 40 stone. Mr. Math Man, put that in a percentage and mm. see how much percentage lighter you are than Ponder Whale Man. All right. Yeah. You got me there, mate. Any more dislikes for thee? Yeah. So I'm English. You are? So it's a bit of the popcorn and the kettle black to say this, but I made the mistake of reading Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee by D. Brown a couple of years ago. And the most shocking thing in that book, which is echoed in this film, is how often the indigenous people all the first Americans were betrayed and fooled over and over again. They'd see like awful massacres on both sides. They did it as well, but obviously they weren't the instigator. And But they'd always like sue for peace or accepted it once it was offered to them every single time. And every time it was offered to them, the goalposts would be moved. And they'd say, yeah. okay, we, we want peace. The Americans would say to like natives, we want peace. But now you've got to move your, your, your reservation or your hunting grounds 100 miles south of here to an arid land. And they'd accept it. And so every time they, they gave peace to the Western expansion in the States, every time they gave peace, they just kept giving up more and more land. Yeah. And what that meant was they, they'd get smaller and more concentrated, become reservations in the end. And watching this film, just the whole time I was watching it, I probably didn't enjoy it as much because I'd read this excellent haunting book about how the native indians were treated and you know essentially there was a genocide involved and obviously again i'm english this is not a diss on americans Mm. if anyone's guilty of horrific shit we're one of the first it's good that you're highlighting that yeah well i'm 100 but every country has yeah. There ain't a country on earth you couldn't read their history and find out that whoever took power whoever had more money more men didn't commit atrocities it happens yeah watching it it just frustrated me again watching the native Indians almost, I think the way they observe the world, and that's probably how I see it when it's portrayed in films, but having read a good book about them, it's almost like they want the world to be in harmony with nature. And that's almost a, a soft point. That's almost a way to attack them well, because you, they want harmony. If you show a weakness, you bet your bottom dollar someone's going to exploit it. And that's, I think that's what's hard to for me it was hard to watch this movie because of that i'm like oh god how do you not know you're being done over again 
I mean, that's a solid point. Don't put the hatchet down, man. Fuck it. Get get obliterated, but go down fighting. Yeah. I I mean, I, I'm not one to talk on the, the subject because my education is pretty much solely on this film and other films that are sort of dancing around this subject matter. But is this a case of it being patient zero? Is this the first time that they've been, they're dealing with the non-Native Americans and they got screwed over? Is this the first instance so they didn't know any better? They trusted and then was... Oh, God, no, no. You're going back to Flintlock musket days. Yeah. Way, way back. So, so when the Spanish first landed in Central South America, they're also Native Americans, you know, the Incas, mm. the, the Aztecs, all considered Native Americans, yeah. the Navajo, Chickasaw, Choctaw, Mohicans, all of them. They were tribes. It was tribal nature, the hunter-gatherers. Etc. So the, their history was rich. By the time this film happened, it they, was completely. Uh, they were completely aware and knew of all the tragedies that had happened to so, to the to their people. Yeah, I mean, even in the film, they're they're called incompetents. They're not even allowed to access their own money without a white person to do it for them. So they've already been like degraded. They've already been subjected to being considered inferior. Yeah, the only thing that protected them a bit in this film is that more laws have been established because yeah. World War it's World War One, isn't it? It's set after World War One. So, you know, America's complete. There's you know, California's a part of America, Texas is a part of America. Mm. It's it, law sort of governs the land. And it's just their luck that the oil was found on their tribal lands. So they had rights to the oil, head rights. Mm. And it's still that I think that's what bothers me more in watching it. I'm like three hundred years before this. You were getting done over by the colonials, yeah. So the French and the and the British, and then the Americans got gained their independence, and then you let it happen through the Americans mm. when it was when they're expanding west, yeah. You know, and now now America's no longer expanding west or you know uh, looking for gold and doing all that stuff and creating California Republic. It's still happening, and it's just after World War One. It's just like fucking hell. I'd rather you. I'd rather you went out fighting. Yeah. How many times do you have to be poisoned before you stop petting the snake? Well, like DiCaprio in this, really. He's fully. He, there's a point in this film where you know he knows what he's doing to his yeah. wife, and he continues to do it. Yeah, he becomes complicit, doesn't he? Yeah, and it's like I want to reach in that screen and punch your buck teeth, motherfucker. Yeah, I think you're meant to. I think yeah. you are meant to want that for old Ernest he's mm. meant to be a bit of a but yeah I, I do and I'm listen you know a lot more about history in general than I do so I, I fully appreciate and respect what you say I don't have anything to add because I wouldn't know what it is I'm saying just read that book maybe it's a great book maybe I will got any more dislikes for me that's it dad that's all you done that's it dad now my second dislike we have touched on it but I've got it written down so I'm going to say it anyway just to expand on it a bit more and for me again despite what Mr Quaron said despite what you said for me it's it just didn't feel like it was was the right narrative Killers of the Flower Moon tells the story and struggle with the Osage people being murdered for their inherited money and assets Yet, like we've already touched on, the story is mainly told from the perspective of one of those responsible for taking advantage of the indigenous people. Surely a film like this should be seen from the perspective of those who are being targeted and victimised. Now, you praise Lily Gladstone and I'm right there with you. She seems like a capable actor who could have handled carrying more of the film. Mm. But it, for me, it felt like it was a creative decision to give most of the heavy lifting to the film's most established actors, Mr. De Niro and Mr. DiCaprio. And that in itself felt like an odd injustice. This is an Osage story and it should have been told from an Osage standpoint. Again, fully, I hold my hands up. If I am guilty of watching this incorrectly, then that's me. I've done wrong. I'm the bad man. But. I've seen it three times and that sense of this doesn't feel right. This feels like it's it's through the lens of the wrong camera. It needs to be from their perspective. Well, what does Scorsese know so well? What does he write so well? Criminals. Mm. He writes he you, writes the dark the dark characters. Yeah. He understands he probably knows the ins and outs of gangsters. I mean, the whole the whole story in Goodfellas, you know, it's based on a true story. It's biographical. He knew, he knows the ins and outs of how criminal minds work and how they scheme and stuff. So he, I think he went with his biggest strength and wanted to do it from that perspective. Yeah. I know some people that have read the book, the original book of Killers of the Flower Moon, say that they should have, they should have showed more of their J. Edgar Hoover influence with the case because mm. it was really interesting, apparently. I'm about, sure it was, yeah. About how 
was he doing it for the right reasons mm. or was he doing it to just get publicity for the FBI to try and make him a respected police force so I don't know I think he played to his strengths and we saw it from a criminal perspective which for me and you sounds like probably uh, no fuck apologizing actually we're we're championing Lily Gladstone and the story should have been told from the native Indian perspective yeah despite what Alfonso Cron said Alfie mm. to me I still can't help and that's after three watches I still can't help but like I kind of wanted to see more Gladstone but then again you did say earlier and it was actually a really good point Chief Standing Bear. Well, no, look, it was told from a perspective probably to shock us about how casual it is to murder people. Yeah. And I mean, your point supports it as well. I mean, if someone said to us before we knew this was a film, they put this on and said, watch this film. I think within 20 minutes, we'd be like, Scorsese directed this. We can't pick a lane, can we? No, we can't. We can't pick a lane. No, and we won't. Do you know why it's called Flower Moon? Mm, They explain it in the film, do they not? I don't know. But I know Native Indians, they call it the flower moon because when that moon comes out in May time, all the flowers are in blossom mm. on the steppe, on the hills. So they call it the flower moon. I thought that's so pretty. It's nice. So pretty. What a beautiful um, culture. What would you rather see? A uh, flower that's the size of a moon or flowers that are the size, uh, but, or that moons are the, fire, the size of flowers? The size of that's the same thing, bro. No, so flowers if you look up at the oh. sky and it's one massive fuck off flower, flower and then you look at like flowers well, like in the, the field sun in Teletubbies. No, no, but a flower. Yeah, this. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. But the moon. And then you look at a field full of flowers and they're all tiny little moons. I'll keep it as it is. I think I'm quite sure that we've just all got accustomed to how it looks. If I woke up at night, there was a huge. Fucking sunflower in the sky. Ooh. I'd be so weirded out. Is that a what the plot idea that we need to make a note of? And little tiny moons. If there was a bouquet of moons, I can't say I wouldn't try and eat it. Wait, is that because of Grom- Wallace and Gromit? Because they think it's made of cheese. I just enough always thought the moon's oddly edible. Tasty. Yeah. Take a little bite out of it. Mm. Mm, spread that shit on a cracker. Boost on mm. moon. Boost on moon. Boost on moon. Um, I'll go on to my final dislike, and I'm surprised it's one that you didn't share. Because I, I, when I saw this part of the film and I disliked it, I thought you'd be there with me. I was too busy wiping my ass. Okay. And that's the Scorsese segment. I love Mr. Scorsese, but I wasn't a fan of him wrapping his film up by narrating the fates of those involved. I thought the wrapping up part itself of the film was quite clever. Playing out the conclusion to an audience was a smart move. That's like an Orson Welles one. Yeah. With all the sound effects. Yeah, and that's one that I haven't seen before. But I'd have preferred it if Marty stayed behind the camera. I found it distracting and felt like it was another misstep from a man that doesn't usually make any. And again, this could be another case of someone getting to the latter stages of life and thinking, I wish I'd done a bit more acting. Or, no, fuck it, I'm I'm Martin motherfucking Scorsese. I'm going to put myself in the film. I didn't like it, but I also don't know the reasons why he'd done it. So without knowing why he did it. I, I, it's hard for me. I mean, I don't like it. I've never liked it. I hate yeah. it. I am like Shyamalan when he does it. I, even though I always found his first three films really compelling, fun films to watch at the cinema. Great little one and a half hour throwaway films. When he puts himself in his films, it cheapens the film. It, it cheapens the whole experience for me. I never had a problem with it. And then you brought it up once. Mm. And we've spent so much time together that when I see it in a film now... I've kind of inherited your dislike for it because mm. you're right. And unless they're like already a really good established actor that have gone into directing and there's a part that's, that they're really good at within the film, you're like, well, okay, you're a great actor. So of course you're going to be in it. Like I, I get it. I get it. But when it's someone like Tarantino, Scorsese, Shyamalan, it just lessens it. Like at the end, like you had the guy that was it already doing, the, full well, the guy that was already doing the story was doing a grand job. Mm. Like, I don't understand why school says, unless it was a, like, it was sort of like, this is a passion project of of mine. Like, I want to deliver, like, how, like, this was such a important moment for the FBI, such an important moment for the Osage people, such an important American in, a moment in, in history. Like, I want to fin- finalise it by being like, it wasn't even mentioned at, at her, on her death. Like, these atrocities mm. have been long forgotten. Like, maybe that was what he was going for. But for me, it didn't land. You've done it, man. He did it all wrong. You're right. Yeah. 
do you know how I see this now? Go. This should have been a three-part mini-series. And it's, you know when Band of Brothers used to start? Fuck. And you'd get the real veterans of a black screen behind them just telling you the story. And then the music for Band of Brothers would start and the episode would start. Scorsese yeah. should have st- spoke at the start yeah. of the, each episode. maybe And Tall Standing Bear Man. Mm. I totally disrespected the Osage there because I didn't get his name. Chief Standing Bear, I believe. Chief Standing Bear. They should have had them p- sort of people talk at the start with a, with a black screen behind them and then do the episodes. Go and undo your film. Yep. Split it into three. S- stop. Hold the press, Hold. Scorsese. Yep. Don't release it yet. Don't. Don't. Ah. Oh. He did, Lou. Oh, fuck That's that. how we saw That's it. That's probably how we saw it. <laughs> That's interesting, though, because one of my original questions was, do you think Killers of the Flower Moon would be better as a limited series? Because yes. I thought exactly the same. Yes. And But I thought for the question segment, the answer would be too quick because quick, I think it would just be like, yes. Yeah, because I think series are excellent at establishing atmosphere because the narrative runs a little slower mm. you could have you spent can, more time you with can the characters. you can and you can do that in a series that's why mini series are you know i adore them mm. love them you give me a little 10 episode one-off series mm. i have enough time to be invested in everything mm. obviously expense runs high but yeah i do believe i probably would have enjoyed it more yeah enjoyed it more but god people are gonna go nuts i think a lot of people love this movie well i'm not saying i don't enjoy aspects of it I I liked it. Yeah, I didn't. I I didn't love it. I would have. I think I'd have liked it more if it was a bit tighter. I think I'd have loved it even more if the narrative was. I mean, it's not top tier for Scorsese for me, but we well. If you hate it and you want to fight us, get in touch. We welcome any correspondence, any communications. We'll take anything. Yeah, yeah. Even if it's just a an fu. Yeah, we'll take it. Just sweetly packaged finger up the arse. Yeah, happily oblige. Mm-hmm. I've got some questions. Ah, oh. what are your top? Three Scorsese films. Oof. Goodfellas. Yep. Silence. Mmm. Oh, fuck it. I'm going to say it. Gangs of New York. Oh. I just enjoy it. It's uh, Cameron Cameron in it and DiCaprio, some of the weakest parts in the film. Yeah. But Day Lewis's character, Builder Butch, was one of, one of the finest bad guys in cinema history. And it's just, it's a great film. Visual feast, fun you got some great supporting cast in that as well though really neeson stephen graham brendan gleason yeah john c rye yeah look i was just throwing just spitting bosh, bosh. I, could, I could look at you all day boof i've, I've run out of names i think mm. that's good they're they're free i wouldn't i was tempted by silence i potentially forgot yeah well, loads of good well things. my top three i mean goodfellas has to be there that's the star on the scorsese christmas tree as far as i'm concerned excellently paced film yeah sue poib I'd go Goodfellas, The Departed, Last oh, Jack Departed. Nicholson film. Another one, another I mean, great one. Top, top dog. And The King of Comedy, I loved that film. Mm. It walked so Joker could run. i never seen it. Oh, yeah, good. Yeah, never good. seen it. I don't know if, if because you've seen Joker, you're, it, for me, I saw Joker, then I watched King of Comedy, and I'm like, oh, Joker did just steal its whole premise from The King of Comedy, but it's great. De Niro yeah. at his best. I think it's, quite, it's oddly underrated. Then again, is there not, without me seeing it, obviously I could be reaching, but is there not parallels f- f- between a clown and, say, someone who wants to do stand-up? So there are already some form of performance in there. Well, you're fighting for t- uh, people's attention, aren't yeah. you? Yeah. But, t- you know, you're going to... You, I know a lot. Philip's got a lot of hate for uh, for it, but a lot of film directors show their influences. Yeah. Loads of them. Look at Inception with Paprika. I mean, I mean, if I didn't watch Joker and I know a lot of people despise that film personally I'll die on the hill of saying that I really enjoyed it I don't know people were like oh you toxic man you like it me 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 but I think it's a good film if I hadn't have seen that I don't know if I'd have been in a rush to watch The King of Comedy so mm. there is value in that in new films taking a great deal from an old film and it almost spikes the interest of the film that it's taken so much from so what happens then does Todd Phillips say wouldn't it be funny if it was like King of Comedy but rather than being actually funny he's awful he bombs on stage yeah because you only, you only see one bit of stand up in it in King of Comedy is the stand up quite prolific uh, I think he's struggling to get a platform if I remember it's been a few years since I've seen The King of Comedy I watched it quite soon after I saw Joker at the cinema um, he's struggling to get a platform so he he sort of 
takes someone who who can get him on stage hostage almost and then he gets a chance to shine and guess what he's actually a fucking good comedian whereas joker subverts it he's, he's awful he's not a comedian he's a fucking maniac like and that's through being a product of his environment and experiences sounds like a very small part of the film is king of comedy then yeah in terms of joker I, I it mean, sounds like a small segment i mean there's 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 certain scenes that that you can tell is taken from it but for me you know we've, we've when he washes it. his mum's back pussy in the bath hey that scene do you remember that in joker there's none of that he washes his mummy didn't he yeah but there's i don't recall that being in the king of comedy okay i don't think so anyway okay you threw me there with that term was not expecting a back pussy just means bum yeah bum bum yeah yeah keister yep keister from Another sister. Sister. Oh, don't go back to the sisters. Yeah, no, too soon. Nah. What is your favourite film over three hours long? Oh, that's tough, you know. I do love, I do me so love Dances of Wolves. Mm. Really enjoy Dances of Wolves. JFK potentially might be over three hours. I couldn't give you the specific runtime. I love Lawrence of Arabia. Mm. Love Bridge on the River Choir. Mm. But I know obviously they're they're different to watch now, but I still still adore them. Gladiator. Really enjoyable. I think that's three hours. Is it? Potentially. I think it could be three hours. Really enjoyed The Irishman. I mean, there's a lot. I'd have to look at the runtime. I might some of these might be two hour forty five. Yeah. That's near enough, isn't it? So who do knows that? Uh, people's do knows it. Yeah. This. Silence. I don't know. That's a long dog. Interstellar. It's, yeah. Is that Quite. Free? You're right, there's so many films that sort Just of shy. flirt with that. Just shy. Three hours. And like I said earlier in the episode, I haven't always been a fan of long slow burns, but now I love me some lovely long length. Mm-hmm. I do. I know that sometimes a good old long film, one that I've seen recently that's it's not necessarily my favourite film over three hours, but because it's recent and fresh in thy mem, mm. Babylon. I thought was brilliant. And I know, again, loads of people... An ode all, to cinema. Yeah, loads of people are overtly eggy about that film. But for me, <laughs> I thought I thought it was great. I was gripped. And when a film is a three hours plus, and not once you're going, fuck me, there's, I'm not even halfway through yet. Not once you're not checking your watch. You enjoy it more than Flower Moon? I'd go out and say it, yeah. Come, yeah. For, come, for, come for thy... That's good. I, I think there's nothing wrong with saying that. Yeah. Absolutely. I prefer I prefer Lawrence of Arabia to Flower Moon. Mm. I mean, I just I can't get over them opening shots with the dunes and the music. It's just mm. magical. It takes me. I prefer Toy Story to Killers of the Flower Moon. That is not three hours long. But I just wanted to say I really like Toy Story. Babylon, I have to check that dog out. Yeah, I, I think you'd I think you'd dig it. I think you'd be in my my camp with that one. I reckon. I feels. I feels. Can you, me. you dig it? Remember that in the Warriors? You didn't see it? I've seen it many years ago. Okay. I only remember small snippets of that film. Easy there, Warriors. Is it worth all the way back to Coney Island? Do you reckon it's held up? It never did when it was first made. Fair enough. It was just brilliant from the get go. You, 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 you're, you're taken in instantly by leather, leather, what's it called when you put over a suit? What's the thing? Without waistcoat. arm, waistcoat. Yeah. Leather waistcoats. No shirts in rainy, cold New York. From the get-go, if you're not in, you never, you you're never, never bought the ticket. In. You yeah. never, you know, you had no chance. Ah. Which other historical injustice would you like to see a feature-length film about? Um, I wouldn't know. The, I don't think I remember the guy's name, but potentially, oh, is it Peter Sharp? Something Sharp. Is an English teacher who climbed Everest in the 2000s and uh, there's an infamous cave not cave but a little like cliff dent on Everest called Green Boots Cave Mm. where a Pakistani climber died um, years before and it's called Green Boots Cave because it's the only thing you can see is his boots and they're green and this English teacher uh, he took cover under there he started getting the hypoxia or whatever it is where where the altitude basically your brain starred of oxygen you start to slowly die hypothermia and something like 60 walkers walked past him and they've they wanted to just go to the top and down obviously if you're above 8,000 in the death zone it's almost impossible to save someone but after seeing this man dying and slowly shivering in a cave I think there's a guy called Mark Illis or Innis. I can't remember his name. Sorry for all this butchery of names. But he was a double amputee and he wanted to be the first double amputee to summit Everest. And it, one of his team was one of many teams that walked past him 
and just wanted to climb Everest. If I saw a man dying... Wait, hold up. I'd do my best to help. People saw him struggle yeah. and didn't help him. Well, they, 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 some would stop and like look at him and he was breathing and stuff and they would just look at him and they'd be like, there's nothing I can really do for him and they'd carry on with the hike. But in my head, Fuck I'd be like, me. what is the point in having what could potentially be the happiest moment in my life, which I will only ever remember now for watching a, school, a poor school British school teacher who was solo hiking too. He's a bit of a... Bit of an idiot. But yeah, I think he did have... Did he have supplemental oxygen? Probably not. But still, they all walked past him. And it could be a wicked... It could be a really good Jesus. film into morals. And, you know, how far would you go just to say, oh, I've climbed Everest? Well, well done. You're the one of, what, 2,000 plus people now that have climbed it? I can't believe they just saw someone... Not even a... You are right, mate? You all, I mean, was he easy to reach? Or was it just... I think some people definitely looked at him moved a bit closer and felt for a pulse and he had a pulse and stuff but then it's like well, you know in their mind they're like you're most most people die coming down a mountain so to to try and help someone down a mountain but there's cases where it has been achieved it has been done so did anyone did he just die there they just left him there to die there that is and he did die there he never got out of green boots cave i want to see, what would you call that film green boots cave uh, it would be a good name because it stands out yeah green boots cave but yeah, something like that, or Death on the Mountain, or um, or um, Ain't No Mountain High Enough. Oh, oh shit! Piss poor pedestrians. Piss poor pedestrians. Not really a pedestrian if you're climbing a motherfucking mountain, though. I suppose. Double ampu greed. Holy oh. shit! You done it. There you go. You did it. There you go. That's fucking tragic. Mm. Like, imagine living with that as well. Like, oh, how was Everest? I was amazing. I I did it, I did it. And then always, whenever you think about that, you would be like, should have maybe tried to help that guy. Yeah. Like, I don't think you'd ever forget. And then especially like, so obviously this is a story that's being told now. People know that he died there. Imagine hearing about that and then being like, I I saw that guy. Mm. I I ignored it. Then again, though, like um, Nando Prada said about the Andes, he says, you know, we didn't, we're not rock climbers. We didn't put ourselves in that place. Mm. It was out of our control. So there's a part of me that also is a bit like, well, that guy knew exactly what he was doing. When you hike your ass up a mountain and you pay for the cheapest tour guides and no Sherpas and you die in a cave up there, you knew full well going up there that you might die. So you is put, it a tragedy? Who knows? You put yourself there. Yeah, yeah, you did put yourself there. You put yeah. yourself in harm's way and you died from it. It's like the guy who lost his arm on a boulder wanking Wait, was he wanking and then the boulder fell on his arm? I don't 127 know. hours. Yeah, I feel like you've thrown in the wank. He did have a wank. Uh, no, I'm, I'm sure. He did. He rubbed one out when his out arm was caught, wasn't it? I don't He was th thinking about birds and stuff because he thought he was dying, so he rubbed one out. He did. He did. He man milked right where he was, and then he took his arm off, chopped his arm off. He did. Have you seen the film? No. Nah. So it's it's pure speculation. No, I watched a documentary. It's what. So, so his arm didn't get caught because he paused the climb to pop a wank off. No, I, well, I didn't know that part. That's why I'm asking. But I know that he rubbed one out in his uh, before before the 127 hours was up. He might it might have been at the this t second hour that he was caught. It's two you're hours. Trapped. Yeah. You're trapped. Two hours. You give yourself a a tight 120, yeah. and then you're like, may as well. Yeah. Two hours. Two hours. And Just then the two next, hours. I mean, two, the next 160 saying You have hours. 125 hours left. Yeah. So within the first two hours. Yeah, because... Less it, time than this fucking film. You could move into a, an area of pain which doesn't allow you to eat, reach full climax. I'm, I'm sorry, but two hours in, I'm still trying to escape. I'm not going, well, I'm going to have a go. Yeah. I don't know, man. Well, he was in a huge crack. Hello. Hello. Maybe that's all he needed. <laughs> what would you rate Killers of the Flower Moon out of 10, please? 6.5 out of 10. Okay. I mean, that, that adds, that tracks. Oh, do you want me to ask you what you rate it? No, I was doing maths because I've got a 0.5 in there and you know how that makes me stumble. You gave this 0 0.5? Jesus. That's seven, mate. <laughs> I'm mean, still struggling with the maths here. We well, what did you give it? Tell this. me and I'll help you. Beautiful mind. Say it. I get, I'd, I'd give it 7.5 out of 10, so I've gone a bit higher. 
I actually for, can't figure for, that well, out. I have figured it out now. People, thirteen point five. People, people who are the most basic, <laughs> basic math skills are sitting there going, "You two are fucking idiots, dude." You can't even say that's basic math skill. That's less than basic. That's primary e- that's school. DiCaprio in this film. Yeah. So yeah, for for the reasons I stated earlier, my love of Scorsese, De Niro, DiCaprio, the look, the feel, all of those things, like. I did greatly. I did greatly enjoy escaping into it. It's not top level Scorsese for me. Uh, at the time of recording, we now know that it's been nominated for quite a lot of um, Oscars. Mm. I'd be the one that I reckon it's got most likelihood of winning would be Lily Gladstone in the best female actor role. I don't see it winning best picture, but I didn't think last year that Everything Everywhere All at Once would win. So hell, I have no, no idea. I have no idea it may well may well sweep up. But yeah, I'd go a bit higher at 7.5. That gives Killers of the Flower Moon a total score of 14 out of 20. If you like your true stories to be loaded, lovely to look at and longer than a flight from London Gatwick to Malta, or if you've ever wanted to digest a dim-witted DiCaprio doing dastardly deeds to some indigenous dudes and dudettes, then Killers of the Flower Moon could be a film for you. Killers of the Flower Moon is available to stream on Apple TV+. Plus. Consider watching this one if you enjoyed There Will Be Blood, Dances with Wolves and Hostiles. Should we play a game? Give it a name, give it a name, give it a name now. We birth a plot and then make a trailer. What the plot? Action! Okay, my turn today. I'm going to do a little quote for you and give you a little insight. Our Billy wasn't born a criminal, Clarice. He was made one through years of systematic abuse. I want an origin story for Buffalo Bill from Silence of the Lambs. And his real character's name in the book or the film, if you watch it, is James Gunn. And he was born in 1948, California. Now, there is something I do want to say to you. So the film decided to keep Jane Gunn's Buffalo Bill, a.k.a. Buffalo Bill's backstory out of the script. But in the book, you find out his backstory. Now, if you watch Silence of the Lambs and you want an origin story on Buffalo Bill, you can alter his past because in Silence of the Lambs, they don't bring it up. Or I can tell you what Thomas Harris wrote about Gum's backstory. I would like to hear Gum's backstory. Okay, Gum's backstory, a.k.a. Buffalo Bill, uh, is written as such in the book. Gum was born in California in 1948 or 49. It is stated that the Jane on his birth certificate apparently was a clerical error that no one bothered to correct. Gum's mother, an aspiring actress, went into an alcoholic decline after her career failed to materialise and Los Angeles County placed Gum in a foster home when he was two. The novel goes on to tell of Gum living in foster homes until the age of 10 when he is adopted by his grandparents who become his first victims when he impulsively kills them at the age of 12. That's very Kemper, isn't it? He did Mm. that. He is institutionalised in Tulare Vocational Rehabilitation, a psychiatric hospital where he learns to be a tailor, i.e. he good at making human suit. Later, Gum has a relationship with Benjamin Raspil, After Raspil leaves him, he kills Raspil's new lover, Klaus, and flays him. So that's what Thomas Harris wrote in the book. But in the film, they masterfully don't even need to tell you that. You you watch the film, you know the guy's fucked up. You could have filled in then gaps on your own. So if you're going to do a a true origin story prequel to Science of the Lambs, you can alter Thomas Harris's text on his past. Or you could uh, stick to what he just wrote, you know going to foster care because his mum was an alcoholic, uh, killing his own grandparents. He learnt to be a tailor. So obviously the backstory can be as per Thomas Harris and we just we do an origin story and we, and we see him almost like a what they did with that Dharma series or a film where we explore Buffalo Bill. And how I think the Thomas Harris universe, the the place he created of all his characters, yeah. Lecter and Clarice and the killers, the killers within it, fascinating. I think you could... Uh, explore it a lot more but yeah i'd love to see an origin story of buffalo bill i mean he is one hell of a dark dude Mm. and a fascinating character within the film i'm struggling to think of a young actor that would do him justice i can't i know the actor i can see his face i can't remember his name ted levine did the original yeah who did it was excellent 
who did the Silence of the Lambs one? Ted, he, he Ted, was, Ted, Ted Levine Ted, played Buffalo Bill in Silence of the yeah. Lambs. You go, oh, was she a real fat lady? Yeah, it's so it's so pop culture now. It's in, it's ingrained in pop culture. The rub your lotion on your skin, or uh, you get the hose again, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, but imagine his backstory. It'd be brilliant. Do you, out of interest, like I would love to see this film. Like it, there's a scene a surge of uh, in cinema about sort of antagonists and villains given like an origin story to to learn more about them in in recent years. Do you have anyone in mind for the casting? Because I can't think of a younger actor that looks like Ted Levine. Ted Levine. Um, maybe one. Of the, maybe a scar scarred. Ooh. But he he's the clown in it, isn't he? Or maybe one of the young lads from from Dunkirk. Tom Glyn Carney. He's good. He's a very charming, handsome young actor. Yeah. You, you know, he's the lad on one of the rescue boats with his dad. He, he's on the same boat as Keown. Yes. And Ke- I haven't know, seen that. F- it rings a bell. I haven't seen it for so long. I do have that one. That guy. Sh- I'm showing Adam with my screen. Oh, he, is he a bit too handsome? I mean, he's very handsome. He's and a I don't handsome think, dude. I don't think that probably could have happened. I have, I have one idea. I have one Jesse idea Plimmons. for... Jesse Plymouth. No, he's still too old. I have one idea for casting to play good old Buffalo Bill. Mm. And it's Keir Gilchrist. Who that? Look him up. K-E-I-R... G I L C H R A I S T. He's from Atypical. It's kind of a funny story. It follows. Oh, yeah. Like, he's 31, but he's a young looking guy. He looks young. And I think, like, he could play that sort of troubled younger person. So it I, follows. Yeah. I could see him playing. He's a great actor. He's fantastic in Atypical. I'd like to see him in more, more things, especially in a in a leading role. And this would be really challenging for him, like a character that I've never seen him portray. That's well casted because he would he would definitely play a kid who looks weak in yeah. the start of his life. Yeah, and I think I I'm struggling. And as you were speaking and giving me a an, a major what the plot synopsis that was incredible by the way that he's someone that sprung to mind I was like I could see him mm. he's got a slight resemblance of Ted Levine so I think I'd go with him it's the mouth it's the mouth I yeah, see it, I see it now. and he could be quite I reckon he could be quite troubling and that is a film I would watch it would be a shocking film because to go through foster homes and like Hannibal says yeah. he didn't become a criminal he was made one through yeah. years of systematic abuse you're watching a film about that Yeah, that is rough oh don't put that oh no I'm not going to say it okay yeah, good, good, because I don't know what you was gonna say then. Um, so this is a this is a thriller. It'd have to be a dark film. Would it be too on the nose to go for Jonathan Demme? Is he still alive? Is he still floating about? I don't know if he's still alive. And for some strange reason, I've started to use the computer randomly in season two episode, whatever this is. Yeah. So I'm gonna have a look. No, do it because it's help. It's is Jonathan us. Demme still Cause alive? He he obviously done a great job with. Sunset. He died twenty six April two thousand seventeen. Okay, well we'll go with someone different. Any uh, then? That's fine. Uh, you got any ideas? Lars von Trier. Mm. Only for the grotesque bits. Mm. When it comes to storytelling or framing a shot, he ain't shit. Yeah. No, nah, don't use him. I tell That's you, what I was going to say. I'm going to go. I'm going to go. Tried and tested, Denny Villeneuve. Oh yes, because he's handled all re- already existing. Um, intellectual property with Blade Runner, Incendi. with yeah, but with Blade Runner with um, June, like mm-hmm. he's he's you know you can rely on him with the franchise, so to speak. Yeah, I think he'd be able to uh, to handle an established character and do a good job of it. It's important that the film wouldn't be a glamorization of a villain, more of a deep study into why Buffalo Bill became who he is. Mm-hmm. So it'd be a straight up drama with Villano at the at the helm. And it's cool to think as well, in this film, he can he cannot be called Buffalo Bill because he's only Buffalo Bill when he starts killing in Silence of the Lambs. And his real name's James Gum. He's, the character's real name's James Gum. Gum. James Gum. Isn't it weird? It's like Not it, James. You left, you left the, 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 the eye out of Jamie or something, but you've got James. Yeah. James Gum, as in gums. But if you didn't get that, yeah. But yeah, so, but there, I, he can't be Buffalo Bill. But I would, I'm tempted to still call the film just Bill. Would you? Because it's in it, everybody knows Buffalo Bill, 
and it's how he becomes Bill. I th- becoming Bill's too on the nose. It sounds like it could be like a fucking rom com or something. Becoming Bill sounds like a neighbourly sitcom from sixty Surbiton, yeah. England. But <laughs> it's becoming Bill. Yeah. Do, 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 do. Yeah. No. No one wants to see that. Put the kettle on, love. It's becoming Bill. Yeah. No one wants to see that. Sorry. No. I like that. So I, I, I would, I think I would just call this film directed by Denny Villeneuve and starring Gil, Keir Gilchrist, and I think I would just call it Bill. Look at him, Starling. Tell me what you see. Monster isn't born. He is created. Oh, he's a white male. Uh, serial killers tend to hunt within their own ethnic groups. My mother, she didn't love me. Guess what? I didn't love my mother. He's not a drifter. He's got his own house somewhere, not an apartment. What he does with them takes privacy. It only started with my grandparents. Because mommy, she wasn't home. He's in his 30s or 40s. He's got real physical strength. I will transcend. I will transform. And he's never impulsive. He'll never stop. Why not? Will you come with me? I'd come with me.